after so much rallying success with the gorgeous little Alpine A110 in the early 70s, Renault craved that taste of victory which Lancia had stolen from them so effectively with their Stratos. Who could have imagined that their solution to that problem would be this, the Renault 5. The humble little Renault 5 was first offered to the public way back in 1972, when you could choose from a little 800cc engine or upgrade to the optional one litre. Nobody could have imagined then just how important its short wheelbase, a monocoque chassis and roomy hatchback shape would become nearly a decade later. By the mid-70s, Lancia were changing the landscape of international rallying with their revolutionary Stratos. One of the victims was Renault, who up until that point had enjoyed massive success with their gorgeous little Alpine A110. That car sadly was immediately outdated by the Stratos. Towards the end of that decade, Renault's vice president of production, Jean Terramorzi, demanded a return to the top of international rallying. He charged Bertoni's Marc Deschamps with restyling the little Renault 5 to accommodate a mid-engine and rear-wheel drive configuration. This, he hoped, would be the surprising car to return the French mark to the top step of the podium. Initially, only four engineers were deployed to a back room at Renault Alpine's Dieppe factory to work on the new project. The initial plan was for the mid-mounted engine to be carried by a steel tubing subframe, but it was too expensive. And in the end, a decision was taken simply to cut a hole in the Renault 5's monocoque and create a cradle that would house the engine and the transmission. Deschamps set to work and enlisted his Bertoni colleague Marcello Gandini to help restyle the back end of the car around that newly positioned power plant. So impressed was Terra Morsi with the reappropriation of their sweet little hatchback that he immediately gave the green light for the first prototypes to be developed. At this time, Renault were pushing the forefront of turbo technology in Formula One. And they decided to harness some of that and put it into the tiny little hatchback. A T3 Garrett turbocharger was added to the little 1.4 litre four-cylinder inline engine, giving 162 brake horsepower. Production began at the Dieppe factory in 1980, and Renault wasted no time producing the 400 examples required for homologation into the Group 4 World Rallying Championship. It made a most promising debut midway through that 1980 season and went on to claim its first highly appropriate win at the 1981 Monte Carlo Rally just as the Alpine A110 had done eight years prior. Renault only ever intended to produce the 400 models required for homologation purposes. But the reception at the 1980 Brussels Motor Show was so enthusiastic that they went on to extend the production to 1,820 Renault 5 turbos. 600 of these were the Turbo One, which included all of the racing cars. The remaining 1,220 examples were known as the Turbo 2. And although they still had that eye-watering performance, they featured cost-saving components that replaced some of the more specialized lightweight materials used in the earlier Turbo 1. Although the introduction of Audi's game-changing Quattro in 1981 heralded the end of the Renault 5 Turbo's successes on the international rallying stages. One of the quirkiest ever WRC cars had already earned its cult status.
I'm really not exaggerating when I say I've been waiting about 30 years for this moment. I was very lucky as a kid of the 80s to be taken to the Monaco Grand Prix on a semi-regular basis to watch the Formula One. But I remember hassling my dad to make sure that we reached our grandstand seats in time to watch the Renault 5 Euro Cup, which was a whole grid packed full of these turbocharged, race-bred, mid-engine, rear-wheel drive hot hatches. Oh, it doesn't disappoint. Very taut, quite heavy steering with absolutely no power assistance whatsoever. Really reminding you that you're at the wheel of a proper racing car, even though to most onlookers at first glance, we might look like we're on our way to the supermarket. The driving position is utterly ridiculous. I feel like I'm sat so upright and pressed forward that my nose is almost slamming into this very vertical windscreen. I could almost reach out and touch the end of the bonnet. It feels so close. It's all, of course, to accommodate that mid-mounted 1.4 litre, 160 horsepower, inline four cylinder turbocharged engine that is perched about five centimeters behind my right shoulder. Surprisingly, given the engine's proximity, it doesn't feel at all noisy in the cabin. It's so effectively cloaked in that fabulously 80s burnt orange carpet. You can really feel the lack of body roll and the absolute intolerance for any broken bits of surface underneath you. But I love it because you know exactly where the car is at all times. And on these twisty mountain roads, when the road just drops away, there's not enough droop for the tire to stay in contact with the road. And it just gently pushes the front into an understeer. Meanwhile, crank on the lock, spool up the turbo and get ready for a nice bit of oversteer on the exit. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> Most homologation specials are made in the bare minimum numbers necessary to satisfy the rule makers. Many don't even achieve that, but some, very few in fact, go on to be so well received that their production run is extended way, way further. This is one of those cars.